Dr. Ferguson is the Chief Executive Officer of the Rural Alaska Community Action Program from Anchorage, Alaska. Um, and there are many accolades um, to say about Dr. Ferguson. You can read some of them um, in the bio. Um, you'd have to sort of dedicate the whole, um, all of this, um, to talk about all of his accomplishments. And for me, I am just wild about store outside your door, so I'm close to <laughs> store outside your door. And if somehow you've missed that, be sure to go to YouTube and watch all of the store outside your door videos. They're uh, inspirational and outstanding. With that, I'm going to hand over the um, podium to Dr. Ferguson, who is speaking about indigenous foods improve health. Kila Eklund, a song, Kangu, Gary Ferguson, a cook. Good morning. My name is Gary Ferguson, and I'm honored to speak to you today. I, last year I was here, and I was wearing the uh, badge with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, and uh, they gave me this really amazing going away ceremony that um, Rolf Helgeson, the chief executive officer, um, gave me one of the traditional Southeast um, paddles, and he dipped it in salt water and said, Gary, here's the headwaters of of your career, and you can always um, come back as well as work closely with us. So I um, respect my journey in tribal health and all of the, the lessons I've learned and all of the mentors I've had and the great support I've had from the Tribal Health Consortium and also my home region, Eastern Aleutian Tribes. Uh, it's helped make me who I am and helped strengthen my voice. So now I work with the Rural Alaska Community Action Program, and um, I believe that uh, we need to step, step up and we need to step up in leadership. And if we want to see change, we have to lead change. And so this is uh, one of my ways of leading change is stepping into a chief executive officer position. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. I love Rural Cap. Rural Cap has uh, an amazing um, presence across the state of Alaska. And our, our vision is very similar to the work I've been doing um, across the years. Uh, healthy people, sustainable communities, and, and vibrant cultures. And I love the last piece, the vibrant cultures part, because that really ties into the work that we're doing around nutrition and around food security and in healthy communities. Our mission is to empower low-income Alaskans through advocacy, education, affordable housing, and direct services that respect our unique values and cultures. And this is a really important mission as we look at some of the challenges of rural Alaska especially faces, but the whole state as we are the only community action agency in the state. So I'm going to start with um, a slide that I've used in many of my presentations, but I think it's really important to, to discuss when we think about nutrition, the importance of, of a lifelong um, journey of well-being. And it's the concept of the morbidity line, the, the time at which we are um, healthy and vital to the point at which we die. And ideally, that we want that to be a really sharp, precipitous decline that you know, we live to our 70s or 80s, and then all of a sudden we um, face our time when it's time for us to leave the planet, and, and, then, we, and then we pass on. And the challenge is, is uh, and by the way, these are one of my favorite plants, a very strong, fragrant, um, it's, we call it the puchki locally in my region, but it's a cow parsnip, and it's an amazing this time of year. And we're approaching this time of the year as we approach fall, the fall of our lives. But unfortunately, in uh, and across our nation, um, this is the first time in a developed nation where we have elders bearing their children on a more regular basis. And it's due to preventable disease, preventable chronic disease. And a lot of it's related nutri to nutrition, but as um, Abigail and Liz shared, that there's, there's many layers. It's not just about food and nutrition, but it's also about layers of trauma and history. And, what I love about nutrition is it's something we can do something about every single day. We eat every single day, and we can make healthy choices, and we can celebrate the food that we have. And this is a photo from my hometown um, on Popoff Island, Sandpoint, and it's a lovely cemetery. I um, love to go to cemeteries. It reminds me that life is short, and we need to make the most of our life. My work has been around population health, addressing the social, economic, 
environmental and cultural determinants of health and well-being, and I spent um, quite a bit of my career as well also in a clinical setting as a naturopathic physician. But I really feel like my work has led me to a, a more large um, scope as we address the, the roots and cause of disease, as we address um, healthy families and nutrition, and as we address um, the domains of health influence that we know clinical, and for those of, of us who are clinicians, how many of you have a, have a clinical role in your, your organization? How many of us are clinicians? Okay, so some of us are clinicians, and, it, and it's important to remember that's an important part of the work that we do. And at the same time, we understand that 80% of the other domains of health um, are influencing the work that um, you're doing in the clinic. And when we think of health behaviors, um, whether or not we use tobacco, uh, act physically active, healthy eating, um, our social and economic conditions, or whether or not we have a house, um, uh, what our education level is, family and, and social supports, and also our physical environment. These are other drivers that we need to address if we're really truly going to get to the roots of our health and well-being. We need to go to the headwaters. And as Maslow shared, um, we need to address the basic needs first. And one of the, the really important principles is as we address the physiological needs, um, um, food, nutrition, um, water, and then right above that is safety, feeling safe, the ability to have the engaged parasympathetic nervous system to be able to relax, to take a deep breath, and to be in gratitude. But one of the things that I learned recently, well, in the last several years, is that Maslow actually learned this whole principle from the Blackfoot Nation. And so I think it's a really important thing to, to recognize is this incredible knowledge that our ancestors have had across the nation as we look at not only individual actualization through Maslow's hierarchy, but also community actualization and cultural perpetuity, which is really the peak of the, the model as related to the Blackfoot Nation, as I've read. In Alaska, um, a lot of the questions have been, it's like, well, how, how healthy were we? And what was it like prior to colonization? And what were the impacts of colonization? And so I draw our attention to Dr. Weston Price, a dentist who came to Alaska and did work in the, the 30s, primarily in the interior part of Alaska, working with our Chupik and Yupik people. And he examined them, and he documented them in pictures. And he said, these people are examples of physical excellence in dental perfection such as seldom been excelled by any race in the past or the present. He talked about maternal child health of our strong, rugged babies, and that we had virtually no dental decay until we started eating Western food, until we ate out of the, the local store, the ship store. And the fact that's when our dental carry started. But he noticed that not only did our dental carry start, but also the first generation of children born from those who ate Western foods not only did they have dental caries, but they also had metabolic changes. They had dental arch deformities. They had crooked teeth and changed facial form. And he um, said in um, 1933, we have few problems more urgent or more challenging than reversing these trends. And of course, beautiful children, but changes underway metabolically due to diet and nutrition. And he traveled across the, the, the world in Micronesia and other indigenous populations, and he found a parallel across all indigenous people. The loss of ancestral diet caused dental health to plummet with defects in the next generations with the switch to processed foods. So, so not only are we seeing changes in your mouth and dentition, but also metabolically. And we're seeing this across the nation as we look at um, colonization and the effects of a Western diet. And it's complicated. It's not just about food, but I'm going to focus primarily on food. Um, Holly mentioned the store outside your door, which was a word play off of an Alaska Magazine article and, uh, and some input from elders um, that how do we keep a more subsistence-based lifestyle, the fact that it isn't free, that it costs money to have gas, and it's a luxury to go hunting for many community members. It's 200 or $300 just to go on a moose hunt for the gas, and then you've got all your supplies, so you're talking maybe 1000 to $2,000, and so if you don't get a moose, good luck, right? Maybe you want to uh, bet on the local store, which really doesn't have the most nutrient-dense foods, but hopefully people make the right choice and, and we pool together our resources and go hunting and fishing and, and collecting from the land. But we know it's a changing picture and we know that it's affecting our health. 
There's been a dramatic increase in diabetes and chronic disease, and I got to be a part of a research team um, helping ourselves to health, and I want to credit uh, Jennifer Johnson and, and uh, Betsy Knobman, who helped us um, with formative research for this project. Uh, addressing factors that contribute to obesity among Alaska Native people, and this was working with primarily our Yupik um, and um, Nupik population in um, Norton Sound and all in Southwest Alaska. And what we found is that you know we're definitely switching to a more Western-based diet, and the majority of our calories are coming from store-bought foods. But what was interesting is the third bullet there is that traditional foods provided, and it was less than 5% of the energy intake, a huge amount of nutrition. 34% of protein, 27% of iron, 23% of vitamin A, zinc, um, and it was very low in carbohydrates. And so even though our lives are switching to more Western processed foods, those nutrient-dense traditional foods are our saving grace. And we need to keep that. We need to keep eating our traditional foods. And as other researchers, um, some of our colleagues at Alaska Medical Center and the Center for Alaska Health Research um, recently studied this last year, they looked at our blood bank and looked at our blood specimens and found that, um, like for example, people say, well, what was our vitamin D level prior to um, eating more Western diet? And everybody's like, oh, it was probably low, just like everybody else. You're in the north of Alaska, everybody's got low vitamin D levels. Well, what they found was, is that the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, that um, our historical vitamin D levels were very high and they directly correlated to a traditional marine and traditional food intake. And so they looked at uh, nitrogen isotopes, um, to, which is a proxy for uh, traditional marine food intake, and they found a direct correlation between declining vitamin D levels and traditional food intake um, across the generations. And so what we're finding is, is that these traditional foods, these foods in Alaska, and of course we have different diets in Alaska than across the nation, but our traditional foods are our lifeblood. They are the way that we have stayed healthy across the generations, and we need to make sure we remember how healthy they've made us. Uh, a little bit older study, the Gokadan study, showed um, in the, this is a Norton Sound, again, working with our uh, Yupik, Chupik, and Inupik populations of the state, found a lowered prevalence of impaired glucose tolerance um, pre-diabetes um, with people who consume seal oil and salmon regularly. And before, people used to think, well, seal oil, that's got to be terrible for your cardiovascular system, right? It's fat. Fat is bad. Well... As we've, as we've seen in the studies and also in the politics that uh, the sugar industry greatly influenced demonizing of fat. And so we know that healthy fat is really good for you. And our traditional diet the, with these really nutrient-dense omega-3 um, concentrated fats are incredibly good for cardiovascular health as well as for diabetes prevention. And we found that many of our populations are hardwired for a more traditional diet. This is a study that was looking at our Inuit population in Canada, but the crossover is, is we're, we're all connected when we look at our, our Inuit population across the north in Alaska as well. And we found this congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency, which um, some of the researchers are saying maybe in up to 10% of our population that are, are, are really impacted, maybe even more that are minimally or moderately impacted. And basically, it's a failure to thrive for children who eat um, carbohydrates, sugars, um, and do really well once you eat traditional foods, a more protein and fat-based diet, and um, elders included. Uh, so it's one of those where, you know, birthday cake, you have to take special enzymes to, to eat birthday cake. Um, but if you eat your traditional diet, um, and maybe uh, some traditional um, Eskimo ice cream or a gudak or uh, all of our traditional names for it, you know, that might be a better choice. There's also research looking at the CPT1A Arctic variant, which um, we don't know as much about right now, but we know that it's a fatty acid, fatty acid oxidation um, genetic variant, that it's a wild type, so it's, a, it's, a, it's nature's way of allowing us to evolve and adapt to our, our high-fat diet, and it's, right now we're seeing some disease and morbidity and mortality associated with a, this genetic variant, and there's research right now going on looking at if you had a more traditional diet, would it influence this variant? And my hypothesis is I think it will. And I'm really hopeful for those affected, um, including some of my family. Obesity is expensive. And obesity is part of the challenge across the nation. It's not just in Alaska. It's across the nation and the world. And this was an article just this week um, 
in the New York Times talking about big business in Brazil and some of our developing nations and the fact that um, um, companies like Nestle and other um, big business uh, manufacturers, processed food companies, are going door to door hooking people on these um, processed foods, including their infant formula. And there were articles talking about the fact that um, breastfeeding was um, six months or more by women, and then there's been a decline, and that's been an opportunity for these companies to gain traction with the infant formulas, which often, of course, Nestle, if you study Nestle years ago, they had substandard um, infant feeding formulas in the United States that they brought abroad to sell to developing nations rather than, because it wasn't illegal there, but it was illegal here. And so, you know, it's an insidious environment that we live in where big business wants you to eat these processed foods and makes them cheaper um, than more nutrient-dense foods. And, you know, to me, this is criminal, and I think it's important that we stand up against um, the industries that are making us sick and that are, are, are really making our people... <laughs> exactly. We need to stand up. And not that McDonald's is bad. Uh, here we are in, in, uh, in Homer, and uh, I stole this. This is a viral photo, uh, but it's a real moose um, having a snack at McDonald's. And uh, it's just as crazy for that moose to be eating McDonald's as it is for us. And also stole this viral off of Facebook. And uh, how many of you grew up on fried bread and spam? I grew up on fried bread and spam. Um, it wasn't regular, but it was a treat. And uh, spam and eggs, um, you know, the stories about Hawaii and spam, it's amazing. Um, but, you know, of course, these foods aren't traditional. And there are ways that we've made um, it work in communities, but it's one that we know these, tr these foods are processed and they're not doing as well. And, and the quantities that we're eating of, of these processed foods are very high and, are, and we're suffering from the results of it. As a naturopathic physician, um, I'm guided by some very strong principles and philosophy, and this is one of them, vis medicatrix naturi, that, that nature is medicine, and that food is medicine. And Hippocrates, the father of medicine, said, let foods be your medicine, let your medicine be your food. And I was fortunate to grow up in a small community connected to elders. I, I spent more time with my grandparents um, for a period of time, and so I got to know a lot of the elders, and they became friends. And I learned to sit still and listen to the stories and walk the beach with some elders and learn from them how, how to gather off the land and how to pick padarkis, uh, the chitons off the beach, and seaweeds. This is Elder Nora Newman, who is in the spirit world, and um, maybe she's here with us as an ancestor helping us um, and guide us, because um, these were some of the foods she was especially passionate about, and, and seaweeds was one of them, that we need to eat more seaweed, and research has shown that most of our diets are low in iodine, and uh, seaweed is a really great source of iodine, and I think it's an important um, food that many of us, and we need to trade and barter for seaweeds for the, our coastal um, indigenous population because it's a really important nutrient in food um, that uh, also has been research showing that it's really great for diabetes and prediabetes. And um, I've been able to, to share this knowledge in crediting all the time our ancestors and the books that have inspired me that we need to keep this knowledge alive. And we created the Store Outside Your Door program as a part of the research project as well as elder input. And it's a, it's a program that continues to go. Um, we added the Alaskan Plants as Food and Medicine Symposium, which continues to grow as well. Um, that has components, not just food as medicine, but also our indigenous first medicines. Before contact, before colonization, we had our own healthcare system. And we still do. And it's still alive, and we are keeping it alive, and we are tapping into our traditional healers who share um, such amazing medicines like Sargic or Sargicarac, in this case, with a traditional um, tribal doctor, Sue Norton from Manilik, an amazing medicine that's being researched now for um, liver cancer and liver disorders. It's a great antiviral. Um, cold and flu season, you chew on some of this and it clears your sore throat right up. Amazing medicine. And uh, blueberry um, leaves and, and stems for um, blood sugar control and um, some of our Hudson um, Bay tea. We've got lots of different names for this tea. 
um, for cold and flu season. So we got our own medicines, and it's really important to, to remember as we remember our foods that we have so many foods that are also medicines, and, and medicines alone as well. And this movement continues. Uh, this weekend, we had the Denina Plants of Food Medicine Conference and at the Kanaiti, and also uh, prior to that, the Menelik um, uh, Plants of Food and Medicine and Traditional Food Symposium um, up in um, Kotzebue. So again, it continues, and it's across the nation. And it's really important to remember that it's a part of the food sovereignty. It's a part of our reclaiming of our heritage as indigenous people, that these foods are ours, and we need to be a part of that food system to govern that food system. And this is from 2014. And every single year, I, I now serve as a delegate with the Alaska Federation of Natives representing our region at the Aleut Corporation. And, um, every single year we bring up resolutions around traditional foods, around our food sovereignty and self-determination because it's really important to self-govern and not have other people tell you when it's okay or when it's not okay to hunt and fish and gather your own food. And, and also to take the responsibility to look at the perpetuity of those foods and be responsible with those foods. I call it decolonizing healthcare because food and reclaiming our food and our medicines is truly decolonizing healthcare. It's from feeding our children traditional foods, foods that they crave, the foods that you eat, your first foods, and of course, breast milk being the first food, and what mom's eating as she's breastfeeding you, and then the first foods you're introduced, you crave. And uh, here we have Patty um, and her boy Connor in Barrow. Um, she's feeding him Mickeyak, which is a, a fermented whale um, um, uh, product, which is amazing actually, tasting, and um, he's about six months um, in this picture, and I asked her, I said, how do you know when to feed your, your boy this, this, this food? And she said, well, this is what we've always done. This is what our ancestors did. And we know that that's incredibly nutrient-dense with protein and iron, um, and helping him to be a vital young boy. And I've followed this family. This is about, I don't know, seven years old, eight years old, and Connor's sure a healthy young boy. It's amazing to, to follow this family. And, you know, research shows that, you know, that our prenatal and postnatal flavors um, are learned, and we crave those foods later in life. And we all have our comfort foods, and some, sometimes they're, they're not the best, right, because of some of those early um, influences. However, as we um, educate our next generation, there's, this is a kawash from Metlakatla, the a very thinly sliced salmon, um, and it's very uh, dried and lightly smoked. And um, here we have Naomi and Sierra, and Sierra is crying, and she starts teething on that piece of salmon, and boy, does she quiet right down. And she gets a craving for salmon. She craves salmon now. And so it's one of those where we're setting up our next generation's food craving by the foods that we give them as infants. And there's, there's lots of really great resources in Alaska. We've had um, some amazing work done with our tribal partners in the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium documenting simple foods like fireweed that we can gather in the spring that's so nutrient dense. One cup of fireweed um, leaves and um, flowers is more than your recommended. Um, well, so lots of vitamin A. Vitamin A really good for immune system, for wound healing, vitamin C and fiber. So these traditional foods and the documenting of them thanks to some ethnobotanists and um, folks who worked in our community like Anor Jones who have documented and captured the importance of these traditional foods and how our elders have shared these foods and how they collect them. Um, Delia Stone in Point Hope and um, the importance of um, quagok or sourdough um, and it, the, the harvesting of those greens and so nutrient dense and the harsher the environment, the healthier their foods are. And as Abigail shared, it's like these are superfoods in Alaska and across our nation in these harsh environments. And also our animals are really important. Of course, we want to protect the environment so our animals stay safe because they're top, they're more top of the food chain. But one, uh, one three ounce portion of seal is about two um, portions of caribou or reindeer, incredibly nutrient dense and you know, important foods, a part of our culture. And of course, we'd have to eat six hamburgers to get that same amount of iron. And how many hot dogs would you have to eat? 56 hot dogs. So, so uh, you know, eat the good stuff. You don't have to eat so much of it. It's going to fill you up, and it's going to keep you um, satisfied. And um, 
Abigail shared about our berries, amazing berries. And when you look at the antioxidants of our berries, you know, of course, we know blueberries out of the grocery store that are commercially harvested are super good for you. A study showed women who regularly consume blueberries had less cardiovascular disease. Well, our blueberries in Alaska are five and six and seven times higher in antioxidants than commercial blueberries. They're off the charts. And those of us living in harsh environments, including hot, sunny environments, also have plants that are incredibly nutrient-dense, especially the wild ones that grow in that environment. So these foods are super important for us to keep and to document and to, and to forage and harvest and hunt for because we want to make sure we preserve them for future generations. And um, just document the fact CDC um, and NIH have, have done some really great work at, at capturing these and great stories. And so um, there's some really great resources there and the diabetes aspect of CDC.gov. So if you want to know some of the great stories of the work being done across the nation, um, there's been amazing work done through the, the, the Trishna Food Funding at CDC, and some of it's been in my own area. I've got to contribute. Um, Sue Unger and our elders and all the folks in our region co uh, contributed to Kakameaguk, which is our, some of our traditional foods of the Aleutian and Pribilof Island region, um, which is now um, hot off the press. I don't have a copy yet, but it's very exciting. Is a Head Start traditional foods preschool curriculum to get our young people um, access to these traditional foods, the importance of them. And that's where we have to go. We need to go upstream. We need to work with families and children so that they have the opportunity to have these traditional foods. And we need to reclaim traditional foods in our communities. This is a, um, a project in Igigik that residents are taking on a six-week traditional food challenge and also documenting their labs. And uh, this has been a, a while in coming. I was so excited to see this article that um, the community is reclaiming their health and they're going to document it. And I, I think this should be viral. We all should be doing this across our nation. Just take six weeks and just eat a traditional food diet. And we know that a traditional diet not only influences us nutritionally, but also influences our microbiome. And this is a study with Dr. Stephen O'Keefe, University of Pittsburgh, um, looking at colon cancer and dysbiosis in our microbiome. We know that we're more bacteria than we are human cells, right? So um, this was a, di a diet that they, they flipped an African-American fast food diet in America with a um, traditional South African diet and found great changes in your microbiome in a matter of two weeks, um, negative for the fast food diet and very positive for the more traditional South African diet. So for those of us in, in Alaska, we have a huge increase in colorectal cancer. And I'm always like, yeah, don't forget about tobacco because tobacco is a huge contributor to that disease as well. But diet is huge in our microbiome, these healthy bacteria that protect us and help us make, you know, help feel good hormones as well. More serotonin is produced in your gut than in your brain. Um, our um, microflora, microbiome is really important. And you'll see more research in this. Um, diets across the world, all diets are different, but when you look at the tenets and the roots of them, the traditional foods, local foods, whole foods, Mediterranean diet's been touted for years looking at olive oil and recent research looking at olive oil and Alzheimer's and memory, good stuff. I mean, healthy fats, fat is good. Healthy fats is good. And I saw um, we've got some Hawaiian uh, brothers and sisters in the audience and also in the poster sessions talking about the traditional Hawaiian diet. I lived in Hawaii for a couple years and really developed a huge appreciation for the traditional Hawaiian diet and the fact that it really does for those that go on to this diet, which is, it's hard to stay on a traditional diet all the time, but for those that do, you have dramatic health outcomes. And we look at other indigenous diets, the Okinawan diet, we look at that one as longest lived people. Well, these are amazing um, traditional foods and people who eat locally, people who eat um, um, whole foods tend to live longer. And it's one of those where, um, that's a, it's a great study, and it's wonderful to look at the research, but not discount what's in your, your own um, traditional food storehouse. We need to, to document and also capture how our traditional foods locally have, have helped us feel better. And um, when I first became a clinician, one of the things that really frustrated me was I was being pushed to um, recommend a high-grain, high-carbohydrate diet to Alaska Native people when that was not at all our traditional diet. We had traditional fats, proteins, and a very low-carbohydrate diet. 
And for years, it persisted, persisted. You gotta push carbohydrates. And now we know that one diet doesn't fit all. And you need to eat the diet of your ancestors to feel the best that you can and to, and to battle disease and uh, to feel the best that you can. And, and to not forget the fact that it's not just about the food, but what's in the food. And a lot of elders are saying that um, the chemicals in our foods is killing us. And uh, this is another viral thing off of Facebook I'm crediting. Uh, who knows where that came from, but I think it's really important to look at what's in our food, the chemicals in our food. And um, there's been some interesting research in the microbiome world that uh, carboxymethylcellulose and polysorbate 40, which if you look on any uh, commercially prepared um, salad dressing, um, a lot of your favorites have polysorb polysorbate 40 and carboxy carboxymethylcellulose. Both of them are linked to obesity and gut disease. So pay attention to what's on the label. Eat less chemicals, eat more whole food. Thomas Edison stated it um, very distinctly. The doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame and diet and in the cause and prevention of disease. And as we look at food, you can't forget culture because it's, it's an innate part of the food that we eat, how we prepare it, the stories, the ceremonies. I've had the honor of uh, working at culture camps um, in my home region, and this is um, out in Atka, and some of our young men um, are, are presenting some fish. And uh, it's amazing to see the healing. There's no um, hamburgers or hot dogs allowed. We eat nothing but off the land at culture camp in Atka and we prepare our own food, and we teach our next generation how to prepare that food, including the greens, and live off the land, and create incredible salads like this one. I'm gonna uh, close with a quote from Dr. Rita Blumenstein, one of my amazing friends and a traditional healer who has inspired me, and she shares, we are free to be who we are, to create our own life out of our past and out of the present. We are our ancestors. When we heal ourselves, we also heal our ancestors, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, and our children. When we heal ourselves, we heal Mother Earth. And uh, there's our future generation, and we're looking out for them. Thank you. Kagasako. Um, so the first question is, how can urban communities retain, uh, return to traditional foods? Isn't the gathering of traditional foods part of the potential health benefits as well? So I would say, you know, start where you're at. Um, I lived in Portland, Oregon for most of my studies. And um, of course, I felt very lucky because an incredible food system and farmers markets and, you know, many of our cities aren't quite as lucky um, as we are in Portland, Oregon. Um, but it's an urban community, and you know, I learned that you know, lettuce grows really well out of a little pot that's on the deck, and so do some of the traditional greens. Like I was able to replant some of the traditional greens from my home area um, and grow them right near my house. And um, edible landscapes is kind of the rage right now, and in urban um, settings, I think it's, it would be a great idea is to go to your ancestral lands and take some of the plants from your ancestral lands and plant them in your yard, plant them in planter boxes. If you live in an apartment complex, plant them in a small pot. Um, it brings that energy, those, those traditional foods home, and, and then also get involved in um, local harvesting efforts, um, urban farms. There's a lot going on. It's very exciting to see, um, let's see, where was I re recently? It was Boston, and I went to a Red Sox game. And in the, the stadium, there was a farm at the stadium. Right there in the middle of the city, they have this organic farm. And I was so impressed. I was like, wow, on top of this building, they're growing all of this food. And I feel like we need to do that. We need to reclaim these foods. And for those of us who have a special connection to the plants of our home area, bring them to your, to your, um, to your house. It's an especially, it's a big gift. Uh, the siksikin, the, the wormwood artemisia species is one that I like to grow in my backyard. It's a great medicine, and we harvest it and make medicines and salves out of it as well. Um, so, so that's in a great way to be connected, even in an urban setting. 
And the next question. Next question is, big food companies aren't going away. Is there a way to help them become part of the solution? So yes, and you'll notice that even um, companies like Coca-Cola um, have like, they have of course, Dasani is Coca-Cola, so the water you drink. And the water is a whole other thing protecting our water and our water system and our rights. But we need to work with big food companies by buying foods that are more nutrient-dense and whole and buying less of the processed junk. So your choices, big business is there to make money. So buy things that are nutrient-dense. And work with, if you have uh, angles to work with big business, um, start looking at um, less preservatives, more whole foods. It's the rage. It's, in, it's the trend. And why not have big business help support us in this effort? Um, why not have them help um, fund some of our traditional food efforts as well? Um, I, I think it's an important um, play that we have with them. I think they need to be held accountable, and, and um, social justice is a big deal right now. So for them to be involved in the good effort within our communities gives them a branding opportunity. And you know maybe they'll learn something as well from our cultures and from our values. I think we're out of time, so thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Thank you. And, and good answers.